I don't want to waste a moment in the presence of God. Amen. I don't want to waste a service. I don't want to waste an opportunity to tap in and to touch the throne room of God. I never want to waste a moment in the presence of God. And so we want God to have his way in us today. Amen. We want God to have his way in Longview First Church. Amen. So why don't you lift your hands right now? Why don't you lift your voices with your hands? And let's take these needs before the Lord. God, Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for every need that you have met, for every answered prayer. God, for every miracle. God, for every blessing. Lord, we thank you for what you've already done and for who you are. But God, we come before you. God, let our faith rise this morning as we bring these needs before you. Every need that we've called upon, Lord, from our prayer list. God, every need that was represented by an uplifted hand this morning, we pray, God, that you would meet us at the point of our need. Lord Jesus, individually, God, as collectively as a congregation, Lord, that you would just reach down, that your hand of healing would be upon those that need healing. God, that your hand of deliverance would be upon those that need delivering. God, a hand of blessing, Lord, would be upon those that need a blessing. Lord, we pray for this service this morning. God, that everything outside of these walls would just disappear. God, everything that's, that is of this world, Lord, would just disappear from our minds. And God, every barrier between us and you would be destroyed. And God, that you would just have your way in your people this morning. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And the church said amen. Church said amen with authority.
set free In the name of Jesus I have victory I've been redeemed I've been set free In the name of Jesus I
his promises in him we have a confidence he won't fail mountains are moving waves may stray in Jesus name in Jesus name mountains are moving waves may stray in Jesus name in Jesus name mountains are moving waves may stray in Jesus name in Jesus name trust in the Lord with all thine heart his word can't fail his word won't fail trust in the Lord with all thine heart his word can't fail his word won't fail fear not neither be dismayed made some promises to some people in this place. Amen. I believe that some promises are going to be uh, fulfilled by God. I know because he's a faithful God. There's going to be some lost ones that come. There's going to be some lost loved ones that come home. Amen. There's going to be some people that come to an altar that you've been praying for for a long time. There's going to be some sicknesses that are healed. Amen. Because that's the God that we serve. He's a promise keeping God. He's a way making God. He's a faithful delivering God. Amen. Hallelujah. We serve a mighty, mighty, good, faithful, loving God in this place. And he's in this place. And he's not just, he's everywhere. We know that. He's omnipresent. But the manifested spirit of God is in this place this morning. Amen. And if you need something from him, if, if you walked in here with a need, amen, God can fill that need this morning. He can fulfill that. The Holy Ghost is in this place. And the Holy Ghost can touch you, amen. You can leave here with his spirit living inside of you. You can leave here with a renewed touch. You can leave here with a, with a mind that's been healed, with a body that's been healed. You don't have to leave the same way that you came in, but you can have an encounter with a, cha- with a God who can change your situation, amen. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. If our ushers would get ready to receive our Sunday morning tithes and offering, we're going to give you the chance to give. Of course, you can give in the basket. There's also uh, mobile giving or online giving instructions on the screen uh, for those who are cashless. Amen. Are you so glad to be at church this morning? Amen. We're, we're going to continue praising the Lord together. We're going to continue singing the praises of God. I ask that you don't sit down on your worship. Amen. I ask that you don't, that you don't give in. Amen. But you just keep on praising the Lord. Amen. You just keep on pressing through. If you if you're going through a storm right now, if you're going through, if you're going through a trial today, I want you to just keep on praising him. Amen. Because your victory is found in the storm. The victory belongs to Jesus. Amen. And that's who's here this morning. Let's continue to praise the Lord today.
And it's mine, yes it's mine Oh you see, I've met the author of my story And he's mine, yes he's mine There is a new man written down in glory And it's mine, yes it's mine I've met the author of my story so glad today that your name is written down in glory. Hallelujah. Are you so glad that you are a blood bought child of God this morning? Can I get a witness in this place? Are you thankful that God saved you, that God delivered you, that he washed you in his blood in the name of Jesus Christ, that your sins have been washed away, that the old man no longer exists, but that you are a new creature in Christ. Is anybody glad about that this morning? Is anybody glad about that this morning? Oh, that's worth giving God some more praise over. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, my Savior. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Why don't we lift our hands right now all across the building? Hallelujah, hallelujah. The man of God is going to come in just a few moments, but we're going to sing one more song together. Because you know what? All of this is pointless. All of this is worthless. Everything that we're doing right now, getting dressed, getting in the car, driving here on this, in this beautiful building on a Sunday morning, it's pointless if Jesus isn't at the center of it all. If Jesus isn't here, then there's no point in us meeting. If his spirit is not inhabiting the praises of his people, then what is the point of even coming here? But we serve a God who's alive. He is well. He is alive. He is active in this place. He is moving in this place. And Jesus is the center of it all. Jesus is the center of this church. And without him, we are nothing. But with him, all things are possible. Let's praise the Lord together one more time in this place.
that what your heart's cry is today? God, just lead me. God, lead me in the way everlasting. God, lead me on that straight and narrow path. It's not just a one-time decision that I make and everything's okay for the rest of my days, but as Paul said, every day I've got to make the decision to crucify this flesh and to take up my cross and to follow after Him. Is there anybody here today that's saying, God, take my life and let it be all for You and for Your glory. God, lead me in the way everlasting, God. Strengthen me today, God, so that I can take up my cross, so that one day I can be with you in paradise. Can we just lift our hands one more time before we move further? Can we thank him for his goodness? Can we just thank him for being an ever-present help in our time of need? A friend that sticks closer than a brother. He never leaves us or forsakes us. He never puts on us more than we can bear. But with every temptation, he makes a way of escape. That's the God that you've come here singing about today. That's the God that you're lifting your hands to right now. That's the God you're lifting your voice to. He's a real and present God, as close as the mention of His name. Jesus. Jesus. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad to know that name today. I'm so thankful that there was a a God that came down into my mess and into my chaotic world and said it doesn't have to be that way. This doesn't have to be your end, but everything can change today and you can be different. What a mighty God we serve. What a great God. As they were singing that song, I was thinking about the ancient Egyptians and their uh, obsession with the afterlife. They believe that when you pass away, that you go before the god Anubis, and there are scales that are there. And on one side of the scale is a feather, and on the other side is where your heart goes. And if your heart is lighter than the feather, then you're worthy to go into their version of heaven. But if not, then you're condemned to hell. And I was thinking about a statement that I heard one time. uh, Maybe you've heard it before, but uh, it goes like this. Some men's sins go before them, and some men's sins follow after. And if you're here today and you've buried your past under the blood of Jesus Christ, your sin has already went before you. It's already been accounted for. It's already been washed away and cast into a sea of forgetfulness. But if you fail to have that blood applied to your life, then there's going to come a day where you stand before the judgment seat of Christ and that life of sin and chaos that you've lived is going to follow closely behind you and you're going to have to give an account for everything that you've ever done. And can I tell you that if that's the case, you're not going to find that your heart is lighter than a feather on that day, but it's going to be full of evil and full of sin and it's not going to send you on to a paradise, but it's going to condemn you to a lake of fire where you'll burn, the Bible says, uh, where your worm is never quenched, uh, where there is no, re- there's no relief, there's no respite from it, but there you will suffer for eternity. I don't know about you, but I want that blood applied to my life today. Uh, I want my sins to go before me uh, and be washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. We're here singing about a God that has been so great and so merciful to us. I'm so thankful that he reached down into that miry clay and he grabbed a hold of my hand and he picked me up and he put my feet on solid ground and he established my goings, as the writer says, and he made a way where there was no way. Does anybody know what I'm talking about today? That's the God that we're singing to. And before we move further, I know we've already done this, but one more time, can we just lift our hand with a heart of thankfulness, with thankfulness on our lips, and can we shout with a voice of triumph before we move forward? Can we truly give Him thanks for what He has done for us? There's none like Jesus, but He's washed away our sins, and He's filled us with the Holy Ghost, and He went to prepare prepare a place for you and I so that we could be with him in eternity one day. Oh, thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you, Jesus. What a mighty God. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that I can be here this morning and feel the presence of God. God is in this place today, and as he said, whosoever will, let him come and let him drink of the waters of life freely. I don't know about you, but I want to partake of those waters today. I want it to be in me a well springing up into everlasting life. Oh, I'm so thankful for Jesus this morning. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Acts chapter 3. A very familiar story. You've probably heard a hundred sermons preached from this topic and this uh, passage of Scripture here. Lucky for you, you get to hear it one more time. Acts chapter 3, verse 1 says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered into the, with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Amen. I want to speak for a little while this morning on this thought, the beautiful gate. You can be seated. We read about a man here in Acts chapter 3, and remember Acts chapter 2, the Holy Ghost is poured out, the church begins, and uh, here uh, immediately following that, Acts chapter 3, we find this lame man sitting there by the gate, beautiful. And the Bible tells us a little bit about the man's condition and about his habits and what he did every day. Uh, Each morning, somebody would grab this man and they would bring him to this gate. And he would sit at this gate for as long as his body could endure it. And he would beg and ask alms. And I can only imagine the condition that he must have been in every day as he sat there in the dust, covered in sweat, weather-beaten skin, tired, exhausted, torn and tattered clothes, I could imagine. Possibly calluses on his hands and on his knees where maybe uh, even though he couldn't walk, he could crawl around a little bit and maybe move himself from one side of the gate to the other. I would imagine there were open sores and bruises and scrapes that went along with uh, his daily habits and the condition that he was in. What was it about this particular gate that drew him there? I've often wondered this, and, and, and I think maybe it was the same thing that drew everybody else to that gate. See, when you went into the temple, there were several gates that you could use to go in, and they all had different names, and every gate looked different, and the gate that this man would go to every day was called the Gate Beautiful, and I imagine simply it was the beauty that drew this crippled man there every day to ask alms. If he had to be sitting somewhere all day with only one view, maybe he thought it would be best to sit somewhere where his eyes could at least focus on something beautiful. No doubt his life was one that was full of troubles, and uh, no day for him, I imagine, would be very easy, but every day was probably a struggle. 
And every day was a struggle uh, just communicating with the people that were around him because the lame at that time in history and in that place were looked down on. There there were something wrong with them and and people uh, a lot of times saw them as second-rate citizens and they were even only allowed to go so far into the temple and they couldn't go as far as others who were well and healthy could go, but, but they could only get a glimpse sometimes times through an open door or through a parted curtain and see what everybody else was getting to see. But he had to find someone every day to come by his house, to pick him up, to carry him, maybe put him on some kind of sled or a a wagon of some sort and, and bring him down to the temple and drop him off there at the gate where he could live on the handouts of others. Who knows how many years he sat there. But I imagine as he got older that it became increasingly difficult to get there every day and to set out in that hot sun to endure the sweat and, and, the, and the, the sneers of those that were around him and, and the aching body that he no doubt had from years of sitting and begging and the, the, the sad condition that he was in. When you consider all this, it's very possible that he would have viewed his own life as one that was dismal and bleak. And when he asked for, uh, for alms from Peter and John, the Bible says that they had to tell him, look on us. This man wouldn't even lift up his eyes when he asked for alms, but he would hang his head and simply lift up the basket in his hand and say, alms, alms, is there anything that you can spare for me today? And so they had to tell him, look on us as they were walking by. But he would hang his head and he would just wait and listen for the sound of clinking coins uh, as they rattled into that basket. And and with that sound, it uh, it, it, it spoke to him that maybe I can get something to eat today. Maybe uh, I can uh, in, in, uh, prove my condition a little bit off of the handout from the others that I've received today. He probably believed that the apostles looked at him the same way that he probably looked at himself with disgust, with disdain, and with repulsion. And maybe he was right. When you think back a little earlier during the ministry of Jesus Christ, uh, uh, there was uh, a story accounted about the man we call blind Bartimaeus. A man that was in a similar condition as this man was. And he began to cry out to Jesus, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And the apostles said, Be quiet. He doesn't have time for you. Can't you see he's busy going about ministry? So maybe his attitude and his perception that about the apostles was right. Maybe they really didn't think much about him, and maybe they really didn't want to bother with him, but maybe there was something about destiny that happened that day where uh, for no apparent reason to the apostles, even they themselves reacted differently than they would have in times past. But maybe this man thought that if he sat at this beautiful gate, that it would make him look better to the passerbys. Maybe it would make him a little easier on the eyes. Because how could someone be in a place where there's such beauty and not look at everything else around them with a little more beauty? Think about the place, places you've maybe stood in life on a, on a beautiful mountaintop looking over the valleys and seeing the sun set and the clouds in the distance or if you've ever been to the Grand Canyon, maybe standing there looking down into that deep valley and gorge and uh, just seeing the beauty of that small river running through the bottom and just the, the mountains that were before you. Or maybe you've stood at the edge of a beautiful ocean and looked out into the blue waters, not Galveston, but maybe somewhere else in the world. And you can't help but look at everything else in your life at that moment as being a little more beautiful. A little more wonder enters to your mind. And it makes everything else that's going on around you a little easier to deal with. When you see so much beauty around you, 
You, you can't help, but it changes your attitude and it changes your perception in that moment. And maybe this man thought that when the passerbys looked at that beauty that was in that gate and all of the splendor that was there, the craftsmanship, the beauty of the colors and the designs and the textures that were there and the archways that were so wonderfully made into that wall. Maybe he thought that, that when people walked by and they saw that beauty, that something about their perception would change in that, that moment and everything that they were witnessing would be a little more beautiful. And maybe he thought that they would have mercy on him as well and view him in a little better light, causing them to maybe have a little pity on him and spare a little bit of change and give him some alms. So he would align himself with the majesty and the splendor and the beauty of that gate day after day after day after year. And can I tell you that the lame still have that same mentality today? And I'm not talking about the lame in body, but the lame in spirit. There are sinners that come in from off the street just like I came in. A mess, my life full of chaos, baggage that nobody knows about. I'm carrying around burdens that no one could even wrap their minds around. A, a life that's upside down, a life that's in shambles. Does anybody know what I'm talking about today? And we feel like our mess causes us to be ugly and unattractive and turn people away from us. And we say, who would want to get involved in my life in such a chaotic and ugly mess that's, that I'm in today? And, and it's with the baggage that I have, who would want to get involved with me? And nobody's going to want to have compassion and mercy on me. They're just going to look on me in disdain. And everybody will just turn their head when I come around and they'll go down the other aisle so that they can avoid coming by and talking to me. That's how we feel oftentimes. And in that person's mind, maybe like me, the first time that I came into the house of God, they're thinking to themselves, if I can just get to the house of God that I've heard about so often, where the beauty is, maybe things will be a little bit different. Because I know that in that house, there's a God who the Bible says is perfect in beauty. And I know that in church there's a people, the Bible says, that worship Him in the beauty of holiness. Like the psalmist said, simply, there is beauty in the sanctuary. There is beauty that's here today. And I'm not just talking about the building, although it's a beauty of its own and it's a blessing by God. But the, the, the beauty that I'm talking about today comes from the Spirit of God being here and being on the inside of a people and a church and a congregation to where people say, I know there's something different about that place and it may not all make sense to me. I don't understand it all just yet and I can't quite put my finger on it maybe but I know that there is something beautiful about that place there is something that is different there everything about the kingdom of God can be called beautiful the Bible says that the kingdom of God is not meat and drink but righteousness and joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. And it's so that when people come into the house of God, it's not the beauty of the building that attracts them or keeps them coming back uh, week after week, but it's because they walk into the presence of an almighty God and they feel there's something clean and holy and right about this place. They experience a joy that's unspeakable and full of glory. And they get a hold, a little taste of a, of a peace that passes is all understanding though it doesn't make sense and I don't see how it's there I feel it when I'm in that place and there's something that keeps drawing us back and maybe they think if I can put my problems in my mess and my chaos against the backdrop of all of that beauty then maybe everyone else will associate me 
with the beauty that's there. Maybe it will make me look a little better. Maybe everyone else will be so caught up in the beauty that they will extend a little compassion my way. And maybe they will extend a little blessing to me today. Maybe they won't revile me even though my life is a mess. Maybe they'll just look around like me and see the beauty and invite me into the fold and everything will be great. Like the lame man, maybe there's some here today and you're just looking for a little relief from the heat of the day. You're just looking for a little drink of water to refresh you. You're just looking for a little break from your chaotic world today. Can I tell you that many people don't go to church on Wednesday and Sunday so that they can receive deliverance or so that they can receive salvation or so that they can completely surrender their life to God or so that they can uh, commit to some lifelong thing. But many people come to church week after week simply because they want a little blessing. They want a little grace. They want a little mercy. It's not the eternal things that are really on their mind, but they're just looking for a little respite from the heat of the day, a cool drink of water to touch their tongue and to keep them going for another day. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Maybe just like the lame man who never expected to be made whole. It was never on his radar. Never something that he even considered. He didn't even know possibly that it was really uh, something that could happen to him. That he could be made whole. Never in his wildest dreams would he have ever imagined that. But all he was looking for was just a little change. And he probably planned to be there begging by that gate until his very last breath. He probably imagined and played the scenario over in his mind day after day of somebody just happened to walk by the, the gate one day in his bygone years and see him dead there at the, at the side of the gate and pick up his body and go throw him in some mass grave. When I think about him, I, I imagine that's probably how he saw his end. He probably thought he would just expire there by that gate one day and slip on quietly into eternity and never be thought about again. But every day he would keep coming back to that gate and he was trying to use the beauty of that gate to help him continue in his way of life. There are many people that go to church today simply to take advantage of the glory and of the splendor and of the beauty that's here. Just looking for a little blessing to be extended their way. Just looking for enough to get us through one more day. And I'll come back next week and I'll just get another little handout. I'll just get another little touch of God. Another little drop of mercy. And I'll keep doing that day after day, week after week, until I draw my final breath. And so many services, people leave unchanged and unaffected. And they say to themselves, that was a beautiful worship service. I really felt God. Man, those songs they were singing were so great. And as you're walking out the door, I feel so much better. I just feel lifted in my spirit. Or maybe you say, that was such a beautiful sermon. Not this one today, but maybe others. That was such great preaching. Man, that was really great. That, that preacher was really on it today. And I really liked how he put everything together just right. And that really appealed to my senses. Or maybe some leave and they say, those were just such beautiful people. They were all so great. They were all so kind. And, and I really want to come back again just so I can be around them because they just made me feel so good. And, and everything seemed so great when I was there. They say, I'm going to come back next week so I can hear another beautiful sermon. So I can be involved in another beautiful worship service. Or so I can see those beautiful people again. But every ounce of chaos and trouble confusion, hurt, and brokenness goes right along home with them. And they're still that same lame and crippled person that they were when they first darkened the doors at the beginning of the service. See, the problem is that atmospheres affect us. You can go to a car show. I do this often. 
Brother, Brother Taylor's not here today. I was thinking about him when I was uh, mentioned, when I was thinking about this. But I, I can go to a car show, and, and by the time I leave there, I, I'm wanting to go out and get me a project truck. I, I'm wanting to put a motor in, and I'm thinking about all I can do, and I'm going to get it running right. And, man, I'm going to have this nice hot rod truck, and, and everything's going to be great because that's what I've been missing. I need a, I need a, a nice hot rod. Or you can go to a football game. Maybe, maybe this doesn't happen to y'all, but it happens to me. And I'm, I'm sitting there, or I'm watching it, and as they're playing, I start to feel a little more athletic myself. I'm like, man, I, I wish I could get out there. I, I'm going to go home and start up a game. We wanna, you know, we're going to play some tag football or, or whatever it may be. And, man, I'm just I'm, – I'm, because whatever atmosphere you're in, it begins to affect you. And it can change you. But the thing is, it's only temporary. And that's why uh, people can come into the house of God and you feel better. And you feel lifted. Because you're around people that are full of righteousness and joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. And the Spirit of God is here and it's moving. And you feel better when you leave. But just like me at that, uh, at that car show or when I go to that football game, I didn't acquire any new skills I didn't acquire any new knowledge. I was just affected by the atmosphere, and I'm still exactly the same before I ever went to those places. And that happens week after week on our pews and in church services. People come, and their spirit is lifted, and they feel good when they leave. But by the time Monday and Tuesday roll around and the effects of that atmosphere begin to wear off, they're still that same crippled person that they were before they ever came to church. Some days that lame man, I imagine, would eat a little better than others. Some days he might make enough to buy a new garment. Some days he might have made enough alms to take a couple of days off and to rest his weary bones. Some days he might have made enough to spend a little on a physician where he could drag himself in there and say, I've been dealing with this and I've got these open sores and I've got these scrapes and these bruises and I've got this trouble breathing and I'm weary from being out there. But down on the inside, where it really mattered, the lame man that sat at that beautiful gate in Acts chapter 3 was the same lame man that made his way down to that gate for the very first time time. He was never changed on the inside. You see, the beauty of that gate did not affect him at all. The beauty of that gate never rubbed off on him. The beauty of that gate didn't somehow magically transfer to him and transform who he was. The beauty of that gate didn't make him more beautiful in the eyes of the people, really. And it didn't make him more accepted in the eyes of God. On that day that Peter and John came by, he said, can you give me alms? Can you extend a little mercy my way? Can you give me a little blessing? And I like what Peter said here to him, silver and gold have I none. He's saying, I I don't have anything to just get you through this day. I can't like a junkie just give you something that's gonna that's gonna scratch and hits for you. I don't just have a little fix for you that's gonna get you through another day. I don't have any silver and gold. But he said, I do have something that's out of this world. I do have something that won't leave you here as a lame man anymore. I do have something that will transform you from the inside out that will completely change your situation where you don't have to go find somebody to bring you back here tomorrow. And you don't have to sit in the dust anymore and beg. But you can be completely different when you wake up tomorrow. Such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise up and walk. It was simply the power of God that got a hold of that man. And I think about what the psalmist said. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. I'm glad that I can come in here today and find the beauty of God, that I can find something to uplift my spirit. But can I tell you, I'm even more thankful for the strength that I find here, the strength when I'm weary and well-doing, the strength that I, when I don't think I can make it another day, that I find something in me and something in this place that helps me to go out into the world tomorrow and to face another day, not by my own strength, but by the strength of an almighty God. And I can find it today in his sanctuary. 
from that moment on, that lame man that sat at that gate did not exist anymore. There was a new man that could stand on his feet. He could walk, and he could leap for the first time. He walked into the temple, the Bible says, leaping and praising God. God. He didn't care about the beauty of that gate anymore. He didn't care about looking better. He was better. He didn't care about the mercy of a handout anymore. He didn't have to find someone to carry him back to the house of God anymore because he had just had an encounter with the power of of God and all th- old things have passed away and all things were made new by just one touch from God. Just one encounter from an almighty God completely changed him and can I tell you that if you're here today in this house and you're struggling if you want to be set free if you want to stop going home every service the same way that you've come. What you don't need today is another beautiful sermon. You don't need another beautiful beautiful worship service. You don't need another beautiful encounter with a child of God. All those those things are great and good in their own place. But what needs to happen to you is you need to come into contact with the power of an almighty God. You need to come into contact with something that can completely change your tomorrows. It can change you from the inside out where you don't have to be a beggar anymore. And when you get a hold of the power of God, it makes lame men to walk again. It opens the blinded eyes to see again. It unstops the deaf ears. It breaks the chains of bondage, of lifelong bondage. It sets the captives free. It mends the broken hearts and the broken minds of men and women. The power of God can put a marriage back together. The power of God can bring home the backslider today. The power of God can save any lost sinner that's sitting in this house today. You can be completely changed before you leave here today. The power of God will give you strength so that you can keep putting one foot in front of the other until you walk through those gates of pearl on the streets of transparent gold. Jesus said, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. It takes the power of the Holy Ghost to change you and I today. Don't get caught up just in the beauty of what you see around you and the beauty of the kingdom of God and the people of God because beauty can't make a man whole. Beauty won't keep you out of hell. Just when Isaiah wrote about the Messiah, he said in chapter 53, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. Listen to this. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He said Jesus didn't come with a beautiful appearance. He didn't come looking like some supermodel out of a magazine. He didn't want people to get caught up in beauty. He wanted his appearance to be as unattractive and uninviting as possible. Because beauty has a tendency to persuade people all on its own. But it has no power to keep them. And Jesus was saying, what I'm going to do when I come, I'm not trying to persuade people by some form of beauty. I'm not trying to just be attractive to people. He said, but I want people to know that when they come to me, that I've got power to change them. It's not beauty that he wanted to be attractive about. It was the power that he wanted people to be attracted by. That's why the Bible says that when he went into the spirit, into the wilderness, he was full of the spirit. But when he came out he was walking in the power of the Holy Ghost everything that he did in his life was to get the power of God working in him so that he could get that power working for you and I today here in 2024 and can I tell you that that power that worked in him and worked in this Bible is still working today that same God is still alive he still sits on the throne he still can meet you where you are he knows every need he knows every struggle and he said all to you that are heavy laden come unto me and take my yoke upon you for it is easy and my burden is light can we stand today maybe there are some here today that you're bound by addiction 
Maybe chaos is reigning in your life. And you're wondering, how is this ever going to change? How can this situation be turned around? How can I break free from this bondage, from this addiction, whatever it may be? Maybe your mind has been a battleground for fear, for depression, for anxiety. Can I tell you, all of those things are real. And they're all struggles that we all go through at different times in our life. And and we'll all continue to struggle with things until God calls us home. But there is a God here that's in this house today. And I felt this from the very beginning of service. God is in this place today. We say that all the time, and and I mean that. It's not something I say for cliche, but God is here today, and he's reaching for hearts. He's reaching for minds. He's reaching for lives and reaching for eternities and people. There's a hope. There's a way maker that's here. One who walks on stormy seas. One who calms the waves. One who can say, peace, be still. In the midst of your darkness, you don't have to struggle mentally and be overcome by anxiety and depression. You don't have to leave here today with your marriage on the brink of collapse. You don't have to accept that your family is lost and going to hell. But there is a God here that has all power. Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven, but not just in heaven but in earth as well. Where you and I stand here today on this earth, on this ground, the power of Jesus Christ is just as accessible, just as real, and just as promised to us here in this room before we leave this place. But it's up to you and I as that man with the withered hand was holding it in. And Jesus said, stretch forth your hand. At that point, that man had a decision. Do I want to leave this handicap concealed where nobody can see it? Do, do, am I worried about being embarrassed? Am I worried about, you know, looking uh, less than desirable in somebody else's eyes? He said, no, I'm more worried about being made whole today. I'm more worried about the power of God. And he stretched out his hand. And the Bible says, as he stretched out his hand, he was healed. And there's some people here today, if you'll just stretch out your hand, if you'll just pull that pull that secret thing out that you've been trying to hide away from God and hide away from your spouse, hide away from your friends, your family. There was a God here today saying, if you'll just stretch it out to me and reach out, I'll meet you where you are. I'll heal you and you can be different before you leave this place. As you set it, set against the backdrop of that beautiful gate, let it become a gateway. Let it become a gateway that leads you into the presence of of an almighty God into a new life with him a new relationship and I wonder is there anybody here I'm done can we take a moment these altars are open can we take a moment can we be honest with God can we be honest with ourselves and can we just find a place and say God I don't care about what these people think right now, but God, I've got some things that I need you to work on in me. I've got some shortcomings. God, I've got some faults, some failures. God, and you know all this. You already know it, God. But I'm just telling you, God, I'm here today stretching out my hand. God, I'm here today saying just take a hold of me and and change my life. Let the power that you have, God, let it work in me. Help me to just forget about the beauty for a moment and not try to just leave today feeling a little bit better lifted in my spirits but God help me to truly get a hold of your power today and be changed from the inside out